I'm going to speak about data segmentation for privacy. This is basically kind of very adjacent to the conversation we had with, with John earlier on. And, and there is a lot of overlap between how consent enforcement works and data segmentation. So hopefully this puts in context some of that earlier conversations. So security labels are metadata associated with a fire unit of it could be a portion of a resource as i will show later it will is a placeholder to mark additionally protected information so you know all health information are covered by blanket policies that that require them to be protected but there are specifically sensitive type of information that is a, that are require additional protection and, and that's how a data segmentation works by assigning these labels to identify that data and also using that leveraging that metadata to to make the additional measures for data protection. So the, the metadata can be referenced in policies. And uh, so there are examples of that in the U.S. jurisdiction. I think the oldest one is the substance use data that, that's been around for almost 40 years, I think. And then there are new emerging types of sensitive information, depending, you know, on the, the, the sort of cultural landscape and things that are considered uh, sensitive by the ex consumer expectation of privacy, these categories could be variable and could change. So the key components in a labeling or data segmentation ecosystem, first is the tagging of the data. So that's where the, there is a security labeling service that I will speak about a little bit. That's where the data tagging takes place, as, as, as assignment of labels to data elements or data in, in the case of fire, you know, resource or bundles or element level labels. And then recording these labels, you know, meta.security in fire is where the labels are recorded at a resource level. But it could also be inline labels for portion labeling that I will speak just in a few slides. We need standard vocabulary to, to use for the labels, basically how to say that, you know, what is the, the word that we use for, for identifying, for example, substance use treatment. And that comes from the HL7 terminology, or, and some of those are categories are sort of referenced in the FHIR DS4 PIG as well. And then there's the label metadata again. I will speak about this a little bit later. Label metadata is basically the additional metadata associated with labels that, that, that are useful for different use cases and also for the implementation to, to function properly. And then on the other hand, we have the consumption of labels, basically how we process the labels. So the first and foremost is to incorporate the, the labels into an authorization decision. An example of that is consent enforcement. I, and I believe the next talk is going to be about label-based access control. I, I, I suspect some of that is going to be covered there as well. It is also other workflow decision other than authorization that, that can be relying on labels, navigating or routing the data differently in a workflow, in a business workflow. And then at the sort of more superficial level, the incorporate, incorporating labels into the user interface and the user experience. So, you know, masking a data item or marking it with a watermark or something like that. I'm going to focus on one type of security labels. I, the, the, you, you know, if you look at the Fire DS4P, there, there are different categories of security labels for different purposes. But the one that's most prominent and most per pertinent to this conversation, I think, is the, the, the basic idea of sensitive categories is basically to be able to use abstract labels that would encompass more lower level clinical concepts. So we have these very specific, you know, in the record. And we want to use these more higher level language in common language, understandable to the patient labels in order to put a marker that this particular data item falls into this category. And this, this will enable the articulation of policy at that high level. So a patient can say, I don't want this data to be shared in this category of data, rather than having to single out different clinical concepts or individual data items. The assignment of security labels by the security labeling service is basically a mapping at its most rudimentary level. It's like, it is a very naive implementation to basically do a mapping from these clinical concepts into those categories, in these abstract categories. And basically, this boils down to having a value set or a terminology slice that that would be used as a lookup table to to assign labels and this is the most basic level of security labeling assignment and then there are more sophisticated technologies emerging the you know large language models uh, and also 
counting in the other contextual information like the encounter context and other related resources in order to be able to have a more inference proof kind of label. Aside from assigning labels at the fire resource level, in the, the DS4P defines a mechanism to do inline labeling. So an example that's in there, I think it's, it was actually from a real use case for a shelter that someone is staying at a shelter and their the residential is where they're staying is confidential, but that confidentiality doesn't apply to the entirety of the patient record. And it should not also, it should be also distinguished that, you know, the mailing address is okay to share, but the, the residential address has this sensitivity. So this requires some some kind of a sub resource labeling at a portion level, and the the mechanism designed in the Fire DS for PIG is to use a resource level marker that there is inline labels to process to trigger basically that deeper inspection of the resource, and then use an extension to record the label in the corresponding portion of the of the Fire resource. And then as for the metadata, I think there is there's a few that are identified in the Fire DS for PIG. We have a a mechanism to record who performed the labeling that, that would be that could be the identity of the organization or the software or like the particular version of the software that actually invoked the labeling the basis for labeling you know the regulation or you know whatever jurisdictional or organizational policy that requires the labeling can be recorded as well there's also a standard api for labeling Labeling, which is something that, as I, I will mention a little bit later, is a gap in the current specification, and we're hopefully working on providing an, uh, at least a draft for a standard API to use this labeling service, basically to submit a resource or a bundle. And then the the mode or the, the, the sort of configuration of how to invoke the labeling service in the system. Another way to do this is to configure it in a way that is the labeling takes place offline. So we have like kind of a batch or bulk labeling as you know, as data comes through the system, through an import or data gets created or updated, then the labeling service is invoked offline and the labels are assigned. This also enables, especially like this doesn't apply to fire a lot, but in, in a lot of older documents, there's a lot of unstructured text. And the, that would usually requires additional processing that could be time consuming. And that is best done offline outside of the context of the transaction. But then there is a side effect of that is that we, we will have to update the labels when the data changes. And there's always a, guarantee, a challenge as to, to guarantee that we actually have the, the correct labels at the time that data is being requested. And also, we don't have the context of the transaction. We don't know the recipient of the information. And some, the, some, some types of labels, like the handling caveats, like you want to say, you can receive this data, but you have to remove it after use, like delete after use. This is an example in the fire core that would not be able to be dependent on the identity of the recipient because we're doing this offline and outside of the transaction context. So I, I wanted to just do a very quick touch base on, on the consent enforcement and how it sort of overlaps with the, with security labeling. So the first step is as, as it was covered in the earlier talk, you know, the consent rules can depend on security labels. And, and this is a very powerful way for patients to actually craft their expectations of privacy. So instead of having to say, you know, this individual encounter or this individual data items, you know, identified by their identifiers or specific clinical codes, they're, they're able to say something that is very close to, to their expectation of privacy using a natural language. You know, I don't want to share any reproductive data, for example. And uh, so that that's part of the policy that would be in the consent. It would be in the advanced category, in the, in the categorization, the maturity models of PCF. But then at the time of enforcement, we need to be able to enforce this policy, which requires to take into account the, the, the labeling of the data and matching that against the policy. And that requires the labeling to be invoked on the on the data that's at stake to be shared and as i said this can be taken place offline but uh, to to the 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 diagram that i have here on the screen basically shows how to do this at the time of transaction so when a request is received basically the general authorization service invokes the consent enforcement piece and that would trigger the security labeling service that would actually apply the label on the data that is being requested and then that enables the consent decision service to actually determine, you know, what part of the data can, can be shared and whether or not, you know, the transaction has to be declined entirely or, you know, some of the data that is not okay to share based on the labels should be plucked out of the outgoing transaction. So it is possible, for example, to take a bundle 
and then take out some of the resources that are not authorized to share and then still respond with an okay response and, and share some of the data. So, and finally, I wanted to cover some of the challenges and gaps. So the, 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 we have a, currently we have HL7 expect, uh, specifications for data segmentation, but we need active updating of these and active revisions. I think the DS for PIG has not been updated in a couple of years. There's, you know, there hasn't been active working on, on the fire DS for PIG. So it's sort of like a snapshot of what, what was supported at the time. The other aspect is the terminology. I think this was a major challenge when the ONC was kind of considering whether to require some level of data segmentation. The, the codes that are in some of them are not granular enough and kind of lump in some categories. So there is also this need to overhaul that sensitivity value set and also define new codes and also provide guidance as, well as to like what would be the corresponding or the standard label to be used for each of the sensitive categories that are identified in the jurisdictional policies in the U.S. regulations, for example. Another area that I know multiple groups are working on is to identify value sets of clinical codes that could be used as, as a starter kit, basically, to, to identify what constitutes, for example, reproductive health data or what constitutes substance use treatment in terms of the clinical codes that, that in the content of the, the record. And having a little a level of consistency across different implementations so that uh, there is a common understanding of what, what would fall under each category and, and a consistent in, enforcement of that across the board, uh, you know, between different uh, providers. And then finally, I mentioned this earlier that we, we do need a standard API for SLS to be able to request labeling and get the response back together with all the metadata that's, that's required. And that's something that we are working on. There we, there's an open ticket right now in the security working group. We are hoping that we will have some kind of a draft to be added to the Fire DS for PIG. So I'll end here. I, hopefully I did well with time. Thank you, Mohammed. I'm still curious about this security label. So this is kind of technical framework. Yes, to like which introduce a layer of indirection and it, just from like top level views of so the most of labels are deduced from existing information or some policies yes so it's a, it's like a derived information and i see a lot of intersection with a kind of terminology stuff like value sets and all the stuff what what's the real difference between observation.meta security and observation.code yes so we we're going to deduce sensitivity labels from observation.code or we will have like value set and if you match this value set then specific sensitivity code will be assigned to resource i mean this kind of section and so i think this you know this is if i understand the question correctly the you know there is a lot of innovation that can take place there i wanted to point out that you know the the very rudimentary like the most basic level of doing this is to do, do that lookup. Like look at the observation, look at the code, look it up in the terminology and see if, if we have determined that belongs to one of the sensitive categories and then apply the label. But that sometimes doesn't work. First of all, it's not inference proof. So you might be like, there is a context that can actually lead to, you know, there's other observations in the same in, encounter. There's that, you know, other data that seems innocuous, but altogether considered could actually lead to inference about that sensitive condition, even though you plucked out one, one data item, right? Taking into account the context of the encounter, the related resources, and also sort of weighing these, you know, there, there, there was an example in one of the demonstrations, or it was a kind of a pilot that we did many years ago, that, the, you know, medications that are innocuous in other contexts could could actually be used in a substance use treatment facility. And the combination of that medication with the, the rest of that context could actually, you know, you look at this and like, this is a regular medication, it's, it's not sensitive. So you can't say that globally that that medication per se is a sensitive, is an indicate, indicator of sensitive information. But within particular context, it could actually be sensitive. And that needs to be taken into account into the labeling when it, as, as we move towards more advanced labeling services. Yeah, thank you. And John, Mohammed, can you say, tell me, so what triggered you to start this labeling, security labels framework? I, I think John is a co-chair of security worker and has been around much longer than I have. So Yeah, actually, this the, the 
impetus that you know even predates me with and it, it comes from military applications so secret top secret those kinds of things and how data are even in those places assessed into you know the various categories so that's kind of the the impetus it it, it really you know goes back to that there are certainly models called attribute based access control that are foundational to what this is all about. But as I point out, attribute-based access control quite literally means use any attribute you have. And a security label is is a particular kind of classification and, and done by some classifying entity. So mm -hmm. yeah, it, it goes, it, it, it comes to us from the military space. Are security labels context dependent? So if I'm in different contexts, can I get different set of security labels on the same resource? I think it would depend. Yeah. So the, the, I think there are some types of labels like sensitivity labels. I think they are rooted in the content and the clinical content of the resource. So that wouldn't change unless like the science of medicine changes, for example, that you know, this medication is now used for this treatment and that treatment is sensitive. So that wouldn't change in, in, in that case. But there are like confidentiality labels, for example, you know, it's, an, it's another level of reasoning on top of those basic, you know, clinical indicators. And so, you know, let's say it's, it's certain categories, I, I think for psychotherapy notes, for example, it is identified in one jurisdiction as sensitive data and not in another jurisdiction. So, you would consider that restricted with the confidentiality label of restricted, but it wouldn't be restricted in another jurisdiction where that policy doesn't apply. But the fact that a psychotherapy note doesn't change, it is it is based on the content resource. And then further to that, there are at, at least a kid, there's a category of security labels for handling instructions or handling caveats. And those could be dependent even in one individual transaction. So you're saying that this particular recipient needs to follow this handling instruction and it only applies to that recipient. It doesn't apply globally. So it could be even context dependent in terms of individual transaction or individual recipient. And in general, this labeling service should have access to the whole patient record to make decision or even more. Yeah. So this is, I, I know that the, there are some clinicians in the room here. This is one of those classic economies, right? And so the reality, you know, I'm, I'm sort of parroting the arguments that I've heard on both sides. The reality is that clinical decisions often take place with not complete knowledge. Like there's always, you know, things missing and there's partial knowledge at the time of decision making. So that, that that's one thing. And the other thing is that the you know, having that or empowering the patient to have that trust in the system would usually give them the, the ability to actually share more if they have that confidence that this system is going to honor their wishes. So if they, you know, this was something that I read from one of the results of a focus group that the patient would be like, I wouldn't want to share anything if I thought anybody in the hospital would get access to that. But if I knew I can only, you know, share with my doctor, then I would want to share it with my doctor. So having that granularity and control, arguably, both arguably and also based on some evidence of data would encourage patients to share more and have more confidence in in, in the protection of their information. I, I, I don't know if you want to open this. I, I'm, I'm sure there are other people who have opinions on this and they could they could also provide some input on this. Thank you. So maybe let's have a last speaker and then round tables. So